I'm Richard Svensson and I'm responsible for the historic and prehistoric sequences in the Shadow Out of Time. And these scenes were accomplished using a mix of uh, Photoshop backgrounds and stop motion animation. And you can see some of the puppets used in these animations behind me here. I wanted to make my own version of uh, the Shadow Out of Time uh, using only stop motion animation and dealing only with the parts of the story talking about how the Yith came to Earth, how they established themselves and what eventually happened to them. And I told Daniel about this and he said, well, I want to make my own version too. So why don't we combine our two versions? And that's exactly what we did. It seems to me that most of the amateur filmmakers tackling Lovecraft stories, they seem to adapt the same stories over and over again. And these tales do not necessarily need any complicated creature effects. This story does, and that's exactly why I wanted to make it. A professional film production will probably use uh, computer-generated imagery to create the creatures in the shadow out of time. But for uh, an amateur filmmaker, it's far more cost-effective to use stop-motion animated puppets to create the effects. All of these puppets are made with very cheap and easy-to-use materials such as aluminum wire, bits of foam rubber, liquid latex, cotton and string. The great race of Yith was represented by just one puppet, then duplicated many times in After Effects. But I'm pretty sure you've already worked that out if you've seen the film. The round head, the cluster of red tubes and the cone-shaped body were sculpted in Chavant clay and cast as latex skins in plaster molds. The head has three glass eyes, which I bought from a taxidermist supply shop. All the limbs, including tendrils and antenna, are pieces of aluminum wire wrapped in soft string and then covered with latex. The claws were sculpted in Chavant and cast in hard plastic from silicon molds. The flying polyps, the enemies of the Yith, were much easier to make. I bundled together bits of aluminum wire and covered it all with soft string and pieces of foam rubber. I cast latex skins from plaster molds and covered the three puppets with them. The flying polyps are very vaguely described by Lovecraft, but illustrators usually add gnashing mouths, bulging eyes and other recognizable features. I just stuck with one of Lovecraft's remarks which, if memory serves me right, likened the polyps to cancerous growths. The polyp puppets were held aloft by aluminum wires painted blue. I finally spent the necessary money on some proper chroma key paint, blue and green, and I'm glad I did. Keying out both support rods and the background was incredibly easy. Besides the two opposing extraterrestrial forces, there are other creatures mentioned briefly in the story. Among them are the arachnid denizens of Earth's last age a kind of bugs that the Yith take possession of when they lose the war with the polyps and flee with their minds into the future. I wanted something that wasn't exactly a spider or a crab or a beetle. I hope I came up with something that was a mix of all these, and also that the creatures had a certain creepiness. The puppet had a cast latex shell, with all other parts of the body built up over aluminum wire using latex, cotton and string. I attached a jointed blue support rod to the creature's belly. This rod ended in a modified wing nut, which worked as a tie down to fix the puppet to the animation stage. As with most of my animations, the arachnid was animated in front of a blue screen and the support rod disappeared in post-production. Another puppet built specifically for this project was the prehistoric amphibian Eriops, which represented the early life forms the Yith encountered when they built their civilization on Earth. The Eriops was quickly built with foam padding over a plastic and aluminum wire armature and lastly covered with latex skin. The head was sculpted separately and cast in latex from a plaster mold. The teeth of the Eriops were just saw-shaped paper cutouts dipped in latex. Two older dinosaur puppets were pressed back into service in a short clip that eventually ended up being shown on a monitor screen in a Yith laboratory. The skin on the meat-eating Megalosaur was actually falling off as I animated it, so this was probably his last performance. I also did a scene with pterodactyls sitting on a rock and swooping down over the heads of some Yith botanists, but we eventually scrapped that shot. 
The Valusian serpent people, very briefly mentioned, were represented by another old dinosaur puppet. A sauropod whose tail and head were inserted into a still image of a guy in a monk's robe. This is terrible cheating, I know, but it got the job done without having to build an entirely new puppet for the few seconds the character is on the screen. Another example of cheapskate, dirty, amateur film tricks is the shot of a barbarian, a Cimmerian actually, standing atop a cliff with violent storm clouds rising behind him. The cliff is a still image and the man is a composition of two still images of local fantasy role players. The only things actually moving in this shot are the clouds, which is a stock footage clip, and the camera, which does a slow zoom in created in After Effects. However, this shot is quickly followed by more stock footage of Viking reenactors beating the crap out of each other. Combined, the two shots hopefully sum up what Lovecraft refers to as the Dark Ages. More Photoshop magic includes all shots of the Yith moving about in their surroundings. The Yith city backgrounds are modified images of a Canadian art museum, and the interiors of the city are photos of various tileworks and synthetic carpet patterns. In many shots, the Yith are simply still images of the puppet, moving via 2D animation in After Effects. On some occasions, I've added animated tendrils to the underside of the head in these still images. And I know, more scandalous cheating. Some years ago I made my very own plastic idol of the Lovecraftian Cthulhu mythos deity Tsatogura, created by Lovecraft's friend and fellow fantasist Clark Ashton Smith. I always wanted to include it in a film project, and I got my chance here, since the time-travelling hero at one point sees the vision of pre-human Hyperboreans worshipping the vile god Satogua. I simply took a photo of the statue with a low light source and propped it up against a granite wall in Photoshop. The pre-human Hyperboreans were me, dressed in a cheap long wig, dancing madly in front of a green screen and then duplicated many times in After Effects. Strange star-shaped sentinels guard the dungeons where the flying polyps are imprisoned, according to Lovecraft. These mysterious devices, dubbed Starfish Willies by Daniel, Maybe plants, maybe animals, or maybe some sort of biological machines. I designed them to be of ambiguous origin. I built only one, but three of them are visible in the film. Silicon moulds were created over a two-part Chavant sculpture, and plastic casts produced from the moulds. The actual starfish willies were rigid, but I animated a sneaking tongue and inserted it into the middle of each star-shaped head. My idea was that the tongue was a hypersensitive sensory organ able to detect any unwanted movements from the polyps. Most of the historic and prehistoric scenes were created by layering Photoshop images in animated sequences. It's a really simple method, but it can yield pretty effective results. Lastly, I added softening filters and color grading to Daniel's shots of our hero, Orke. We decided to go with what we imagined was some sort of standard for how silent films were colorized, with a green tint for jungle scenes, blue for night and arctic scenes, and so on. I think it worked out pretty well. I'd like to say that more than anything we wanted to show that even such a complex and uh, epic story such as Lovecraft's The Shadow Out of Time can be managed as an amateur film project. And I often hear that, uh, in fact, people tell me all the time that it's foolish for an amateur filmmaker to try and tackle grand stories and that it can't be done. Of course it can be done. You can retell any kind of story as a film. You can adapt Homer's The Iliad if you feel like it. You just have to figure out how to do it. There is a way to retell every story in film format, uh, no matter how much money you have or how many or how few actors you have. The one thing you wouldn't want to do, however, is to try to emulate the uh, multi-million dollar blockbuster Hollywood movie making machine, uh, because they deal with uh, resources that are beyond any kind of amateur filmmaking. And why would you want to emulate Hollywood, by the way, because most of their films look alike. They are so formula bound, because the, 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 the um, film companies making them, they want a quick return on their investment. And um, what you should do instead is look for inspiration elsewhere, like, like books, comic books, uh, record covers, older movies, 
um, that are far more diverse in their execution than uh, modern day movies. And I'd just like to say that if more amateur or so-called independent filmmakers would just stop worrying about the precious projects, how they will turn out, and let the films evolve by themselves with what resources they have, not only would more films actually be finished, but they would be better films as well. So trust your instincts, trust your good taste, uh, trust your abilities, and I think you will be surprised with what you can accomplish.